The Taming of Nan by Ethel Carney Chapter 9 Cherry Loses His Case Polly went back to narrow fields in high spirits. Had she not left behind her a challenge in that scented glove? She had likewise left a copy of Whisper and I Shall Hear on the Sag Farm Harmonium, the said copy having her address in the left-hand corner. She arrived home on the edge of dark. Involuntarily, as she entered the little street, she listened for her mother's voice, shouting anathema at her dad, the street and the world in general. But all was calm. Either the storm was over, or had not burst. The odour of hot pot met her as she opened the door. The drab kitchen had on it an additional gloom, arising from a cracked lamp glass and a consequently lower light. The economic struggle that had always existed in this house was of so naked a character now that, skeleton-like, it grinned and rattled. Cherry was trying to read by the firelight. His strained intentness of expression faded somewhat as he perceived Polly. He winked to show that he observed her and laid down his book on the wash-boiler. His winks had become stagey things now, hard to believe in. Well, how's Granny Grunstick's? he asked, trying to be sociable. Polly was just opening her lips when Nan bounced out of the little scullery. Oh, that back again, art a bitch, she asked. Unger brinks crows to the nest. Polly took off her hat. Her countenance spoke a great reaction from a childish delight in having had a good time to a hopeless protest against having returned to a bad one. Her way of setting her headgear on a blue ornament her dad had won at a tide long ago showed the easiness with which she sank under pressure of this negative atmosphere. Nan dashed back into the kitchen, on some pretext or other. Cherry mustered a smile. It was sometimes hard to go on taking Nan as a joke. She was such an interminable joke. Then he saw Polly suddenly recover her equilibrium. She got out plates, proceeding to warm them. Where has to learn that? quoth Jerry. He never saw anyone kneel on the fender and warm plates without remembering his carefree life before he had met Nan at the tide. His little mother had used to kneel so. He felt a spur of interest in Polly's following of the great cardinal points in all good coops. Sometimes he found himself getting interested in things but his interest was of a flickering, evanescent nature. Before Polly could answer, he no longer cared to hear the answer. Oh, I saw someone do it at Cherrydale, said the girl. As she spoke, she had the vivid memory of Sarah like a tired mummy, kneeling on the fender of the great sanded kitchen, and a companion picture of Adam, handsome in dark blue coat, looking across at her vision self like a man stock-taking. It was Polly who set her hands to wheel her dad's chair to the supper table, but Nan came up at that moment, gave her a thrust that almost hurled her over, and took control of the chair herself. Polly gave a faint giggle. The man in the chair looked dazed, wonder at what was happening. Then he sank back under the cloud cap of physical and spiritual dejection. In the old days he had liked his meals. They made strength to go on working. Now he sat drumming whitened fingers on the table, waiting for his portion. But he strove to cheer Polly up after Nan's left-handed greeting. I was champion Raggus Divibus Ratibus, offspring of champion Crompton Arang, he asked. It was the first direct inquiry he had made about his once great passion. Forthwith Polly gave a spirited account of Rag, the kennel, Rag's having been cured of worrying cock chickens, by having one hung around his neck for a week, of his leathern leggings, made by the village cobbler, giving him the look of a dog-turned commercial traveller. Cherry smiled. He had felt he liked to see Rag in those leggings. But Polly was compelled to say that she didn't see that he wore much better, amending this, however, by the statement that he was jumping up most of the time, so perhaps she couldn't see improvements. We're liable for licence, said Cherry. He stared down at his steaming hot pot. I think we've enough on here without dogs, yapped Nan. The common sense remark that in any other would have been a simple reminder of the economic pressure became an insult from Nan. Cherry's burden of dependence crushed him 
like a concrete thing. He went on eating, perfunctorily, but the savour had gone out of his food. He pushed the half-empty plate away, listlessly staring at the picture of wedded love on the wall. The ideal, the strength of the man supporting the weakness of the woman. Nan had never been weak, but he had provided for her. He had nothing to share with her now, and they were both of them living on Polly. He sat staring at the picture, painted by some well-fed artist, and quite suddenly it melted away, and beyond it he saw a world of jungle law, where old age vampired on the young, the young on old age, people feeding on one another, as it were, not just the rich on the poor, but the poor being made to feed on each other, children even, watching one another's mouthfuls emulously, young cannibals. For Cherry, scarred by great hurt on great hurt, was now a mass of quivering sensations, morbidly quick perceptions, where he had been a robust giant, without time for deep thought, or even for deep feeling. Cherry, in his own words, was off his trolley. Aren't eating that? queried Nan. He felt sick. No, he said. He felt yet more sick. The scraping of her spoon on his plate went through him. Then he had one of the quick revulsions of feeling common to him. He became conscious that the fibre of his manhood was going. He was feminising. Did old cripples feminise? Better to brutalise, he thought savagely, as he wheeled to his corner. Polly, after clearing the table, unpacked the generous parcel Granny had sent with her. To her dad she handed a pipe and a quarter of a pound of plug tobacco. There were a pound of Cherrydale sausages for none and parted in the church porch. For Polly, there were six bottles of scent that Granny had found she could not sell. Whilst Cherry stuffed the pipe with the tobacco, Nan was watching him. She could not discover whether his singing low of this weekend was submission or diplomacy. Cherry looked up and caught a glance. It reminded him of the admixture of triumph and suspicion a cat shows towards a half-killed thing. He winked the comic tragic wink in response to it. For quite a long time there was silence in the kitchen, broke only by the fluttering of the pages of Nan's novelette and the puff-puff of Jerry's pipe. He had been in tobacco-starved misery all the weekend. Perhaps the pipe cheered him, for he again took up Southey's Life of Nelson, which Billy had said was man's meat. "'What's that that's getting, Polly?' asked Jerry. Polly had given a little excited exclamation. She flushed. I bought a Raphael's almanac, she confessed haltingly, to see if you'd won your case, Dad. Listen, it says, A good day for seeking favours, dealing with superiors, women and the law. Cherry looked at the irresponsible one. One woman's enough for me, he said. Polly giggled. Nan looked at him suspiciously as one pondering his sincerity. For law, Dad, said Polly. Then she said, I'll brush your clothes. On the morrow was Cherry's great ordeal in the borough court. They mind thy own clothes, bitch, said Nan, which astonished Cherry a little. But before he could do more than wonder, Billy breezed knocked and followed his knock, cap in hand, and his usual amiable bashfulness in his eye as he saw that Polly was in. Well, how are we? he asked, in the excess of vigour he always used now, so as not to appear downhearted. Cherry understood Billy. In the pink, he said. Billy sat down in the chair near the sewing machine of the battered box. Ready for morning? he asked lamely. Billy had his cap between his knees like a little lad. He was studying the floor critically. The union had selected him as the fit and proper person to ask William Cherry if his case failed on the morrow whether the Union should fight the thing for him in a higher court. The Union had been astounded to hear that it was possible that earnings might be inclusive of tips, according to English law, and that every man hurt, therefore, might totalise his earnings as inclusive of such and claim double damages. It was worth a fight if Cherry's case could create a precedent. At last Billy burst out with it. Billy had no more tact than a guinea pig, and was as transparent as glass. "'If we don't pull it off this time, cherry old man,' he said, blushing, "'better luck next time.' Then he unburdened himself of the task laid upon him. 
Cherry stared across at him. With a little of the look, he had turned on Uncle Silas. Billy suddenly got an inspiration. Cherry, he said earnestly, a man should sometimes look on himself impersonally. This is a fight for the next man. There was a long silence. Billy realised it as Cherry's assent. He had spiked the proud man's guns. A great relief was on him as he went out. He had struck a blow for his mate's well-being and still possessed his friendship. Nan hung Cherry's clothes over a chair. Cherry had almost beggared himself in paying for them out of pawn for this occasion of the morrow. Polly carried a candle and her new hat carefully upstairs. Good luck, Dad, she called down midway. Tooraloo, Polly, he said. The pipe and Polly's return had made him feel more of a man somehow. In these devitalised days, little things made such a difference. Nan was already undressing herself. The way she ripped at her stay laces made a sharp whipping sound in the stillness of the kitchen. If it's only ten shillings a week they gets, she threatened, I shall tack a child to nurse. Cherry made no remark. He got dog tired at this hour. He waited in sick, demoralised fatigue until Nan pushed his chair to the bedside. Then she took off his coat with the impatient gestures usual to her. That'd be in a poor way without me, she said, unloosing his collar. It was the triumph of the Amazon over the mere male. She had got him under now and didn't mean to let him forget it. His blue eyes looked at her. The dim light of the broken glass lamp was over them both, the woman taunting, the man's face giving no index to whatever he felt. Then a contemptuous nobility flashed lightning in that blue eye, an indescribable look of triumph even in debasement, before which none's slow dark eye dropped its lid. It was the look of one physically bondsman to a lesser man, who was mean even in triumph. It flashed for only a few seconds. She gave his collar a peevish toss across the house, then, pushing his chair to the bed, she watched his pitiful scramble from chair to bed, hearing the gusty panting of fatigue. Finally, when she had let him know his full weakness, she gave him late, reluctant aid that threw him, dog-tired, into the bed. She pulled the clothes over him with a veiled triumph as though she confined him alive till she chose to aid him again. His blue eye regarded her fixedly from the shadows of the red curtains that screened the corner off in the daytime. It had the same half-tortured, half-contemptuous look. I wouldn't have done it by thee, Nan, he said, like one stating a dry fact. The low, quiet tone was calm as a lecturer as on mathematics. Cherry was training his will as he used to train his muscles. Nan turned the lamp down. Jesus wept, came a voice out of the darkness. There was a defiant tone in the old phrase, burning, Amazonish, but under it was a faint sound of something like fear. There was a manhood in this broken hulk which she could not degrade. That old undercurrent of reason which she had ever hated was rising to combat her undisciplined emotionalism. It was the cold quality that divides the savage from the civilised. As she laid herself down by the side of the physically broken one, who was still struggling with those windy gusts of exhausted breath, she felt an almost superstitious sense of a fetter which she could not see. They are of a strength she could not classify. The feeling that she was dwarfed and made petty by this man now almost as helpless as a child. It was the haunting awe of fear wrung from the Stone Age and rendered to an age that dissects life and death, measures the star spaces and fathoms the sea. Cherry was changing Nan's fear of him from a physical to a mental fear. When the exhausted man was sunk into deep sleep, Nan tossed about. She could dimly perceive Cherry's countenance, weary, sleeping, with the worn look of suffering, mental and physical. She stared at it until it began to assume oddities of expressions. Agonising, awful, now fiendish, now glorious. She knew it was the effect of the curtain gloom and the way her mind had cowed for a second only before his. Yet she shivered. Then, turning her gaze away resolutely, she made herself sleep. When she awoke, she found Cherry awake. 
He watched her dress light the fire and saw Polly come down, drink her hot tea and hurry off in a panic because the factory whistle was blowing. Nan dressed Cherry at seven o'clock that morning. It was, he thought, a diplomatic move on her part, an augury of some grain of faith that he would win the day. His degree of economic power was also domestic power. He read Southey's Life of Nelson after breakfast until time to get ready. The vision of the delicately bodied lad with the titan soul inside it, ever before his eyes, making those sensations his own, while sometimes the vision of ice flows came to his sight, the crackle of ice, and always he saw the struggle of the mighty will. The lad to be shaping, yapped Nan. She set him the dish of water on a stool. He came back to the drab kitchen in the morning light, its ugliness, signs of poverty, and lack of anyone caring for it. Towel, Nan, he said. Whilst there was no humility in the tone, a sudden sorrow had sprung up in him for this mate of his, companion of this antimal struggle. For a moment he saw Nan, as he had never seen her before, a captive thing like himself. His tone conveyed a note of comradeship almost. For a moment his personal limitations had broken down. He was wishing that he possessed things to give to Nan, seeing that her life in this drab kitchen had been a cramped one, remembering wincingly all the occasions he could have taken her out with him and did not. She dressed him with a little more care this morning. There was no tenderness for him in it, though. She was turning him out decent to fight for that pound a week. Then she put him on his tricycle, Cherry helping himself as much as possible. He trundled down the passage. The step gave him that jerk he always feared. He went with difficulty up the incline of the street. Several women were watching him from the little doorways, skimpy women in drab clothes with brooms in their hands. He turned his head once to look back at the woman in the doorway, his own particular bit of poverty-limited womanhood. To her alone, Nan, he called on an impulse. He saw a start at his publicly affectionate greeting. She jerked her head and went indoors. Billy was looking down the street towards him. At the end of the second street it started to drizzle with rain. They were quite wet when they reached the borough court. A policeman in the little anteroom informed Cherry that his was the first case. Billy walked and Cherry was carried through the doorway into the echoing oak-floored little court with its high windows. The confused mental picture Cherry always had of that ordeal with the magistrate's clear voice succeeding his own mumbled words of Billy chipping him when he shouldn't have done and being called to order, of the burning thought that they were being treated like children, of the humiliation of being carried up into full sight of the court so that they could hear him better, and of his voice almost failing him entirely, remained a thing to shudder at the memory of to the end of his days. The consciousness at last of being in the presence of a machine, trundling without feeling over human destinies came to him crushingly, the climax came when the magistrate gave the verdict in the dispassionate voice of the law that the findings of this court on this case are that the meaning of said act was that the word earnings be interpreted as said wages paid to an employee and not, as plaintiff asserts, including the tips that come to him by way of his work and as marks of favour. Cherry had lost the option, however, of taking the case to a higher court was still his. He breathed a deep breath as he got outside. Rain was still falling. The tricycle wobbled a little under his nerveless guidance. It seemed to him that everyone who looked at him knew of his defeat. The nearer he got home, the more he dreaded Nan's face when she heard. Billy walked by him in silent misery. Shall I come in with thee? asked Billy. Cherry shook his head. He went down the street alone, rapping on the door to be taken in. Nan gave one glance at his face. Then she came out and lifted the front wheel over the step. The dog license has come, were her first words. Cherry heaved a deep sigh. For once he did not feel the demoralisation usual to him when Nan lifted him upon his chair by the wash boiler. He had been under the wheels of a great machine. All else was a pinprick. Menson came down that evening, representing the company. 
he spread out thirty bright half sovereigns on the little table with its smoky lamp of the cracked glass, tempting them with the back pay of the last half year. Cherry looked at it indecisively. Then he said, I can claim that if the higher court says I'm wrong. You, thou silly devil, yapped Nan when he'd gone. Why didn't I take it? Cherry pulled at the pipe. Because I'm going to have as much as I can get, he said, with a certain dogged fervour. Afterwards, he wondered if he mightn't as well have given him with a good grace. It was perhaps another half year's uncertainty, another half year of the humiliation of living on Polly. That night, wet as it was, he trumbled out into the rain. He went along until he reached his favourite house of call. Four hours passed in which the company in the kitchen became merrier and merrier. Cherry amongst them. His moroseness was gone. He sang, shouted and laughed with the best, was still an atom of himself, a miserable, cold-blooded atom that he could not make drunk, that was still sober, despite all his efforts when he trundled out into the dark rainy night towards home with the fire out, as that sober atom in him knew it would be. Billy Breeze, who had learnt from Nan that he was out, saw something whiz down the semi-gloom of the street. It was Cherry. The flickering lamplight fell on him for a second. How he kept his seat became a miracle. Then he stopped three doors past his own place, and began to rap feebly at what he took to be the gate of his castle. Billy went to the rescue. Nan and he got Cherry inside. He was placed in his chair, staring before him into a dead fire, like a man struggling with a weighty problem. But Billy, he stuttered, after a pause in which he evidently found it a little difficult to say just what he wanted to say. Well, what I will want to know is, where's it, where's it? Good God! Shut thy daft face, Nan told him. She pulled off his coat. As she did so, the buttonhole Polly had got for her father fell on the floor, faded as his oaks. Then, in full sight of Billy, after she got Cherry on the bed, she went through the pockets of the tragically short trousers. Cherry was still lost in drunken ponderings on the whereabouts of the god of the universe. What's this? quoth Nan. She held out a scrap of green paper for Billy's inspection. He's been buying a lottery ticket off somebody, exclaimed Billy, and turning the ticket over explained that it was only a quarter ticket, and about the great wheel at Hamburg that went round and round, making a fortune for someone when it stopped. They were mostly frauds, such things, he said. Nan gave the shadowy figure behind the half-drawn curtains a withering look. If he'd been sober she said, with a deeper insight into human nature than Billy could have supposed her capable of. He wouldn't have risked a penny piece. Their lot was all born in chapel vestries, which unique utterance regarding the line of cherries closed the conversation for Nan, taking charge of the solitary shilling in her man's pocket, and the scrap of green paper turned her back rudely on Billy. He left the melancholy little house where Polly's beauty was like a taper gleam in an abyss of gloom. Some day, when his pal's economic position was secure, Billy was going to ask Polly to marry him. The next few days drifted by without event, save that Polly received a letter and the music copy back from Bob Wilde. Cherry was midway through Southey's life of the splendid Horatio, and spent a few hours out of doors each day. For the rest he sat in the angle nook, planning now one way of escape from economic dependence, now another abandoning each by turn. The squall had several times appeared on the horizon, but had not broken. One evening, as Cherry rapped and was taken in after a run on the road that ran to Cherrydale under the stars, he found a white-faced nun. All that he could get out of her at first was that she'd seen a sign, meaning a sign of death. The knocker had lifted up three times, falling on the door like thunder. No one had been there. Cherry did not tell her of the small boys he had seen at the game. So much going to happen, she told him. Cherry laughed. He was feeling physically stronger. The mighty curries that had stuck to Nan, but being almost killed, on awaking on that never-to-be-forgotten day in hospital, to find himself without legs, was reviving, stirring itself, becoming a vital thing. Nan lifted him on the chair in the corner and promptly prepared his supper. 
When are we going to have our next row? He asked meditatively. I'm missing them, Nan. I don't feel at home like. Thou can have one now, she snapped, if thou wants. The squall swooped near. Then Cherry saw that she was still thinking of the mystic Knox, and quite suddenly her superstition, as her jealousy, became part of the chain by which he would keep his male rights. Is that kid coming in the morning? he asked. Nan nodded. We can't live on air and lie on floor, she said moodily. He stared across the supper table at her. Again that big softness of the little shrew, the softness that he had thought quite dead, stirred in him, that compassion for the struggle to make ends meet going on in this little house. There was a hole in her blouse, a dowdy blouse. Dawdling about the streets aimlessly on his wheels, he had seen well-dressed women and drawn bitter contrasts. Nan and he had never known they were born. Nan found that compassionate look in her mate's eyes more than she could stand. Its spell was something to fear. If thou looks at me like that, I'll throw some at thee, she said fiercely. Cherry's hand went slowly into his pocket. I saw some earrings in a shop today, he said. Would just as suited thee, Nan. Aye, she remarked caustically. When there's no brass, thou can see em. He brought something out of soft paper. Nan stared in unbelief of her senses. He was holding up a pair of pearl earrings with green glass drops. Then she had snatched them from him and had them in her ears and had the damp spotted mirror out in a flash. Nan was a woman with all her hooligan. Cherry was using missionary wiles, but she gave him plainly to understand in her subsequent manner that though she accepted them, she abated no wit of her power. After a while, she wondered where he had got the money. Borrowed it, quoth Cherry nonchalantly. He gave her evidence. Then she gave him a grudging look of admiration. He had gone into debt to buy her earrings. Jan thought he had it in him. Next morning, Cherry was awakened by the crying of a child to the chorus of clogs going past the door. Peeping through the bed curtains, he saw the child's mother in factory show with a big bundle and anxiety lest little Rob should keep on crying when she had gone. Nan held the struggling child, a little lad of just over two years, with a head kinked over with red gold curls, two frightened eyes like a young pup's, and the rest with dishevelled blankets and red shawl. And I brought his milk, said Rob's mother. See, Rob, the lady'll be thy mummy today. Eh, hey, do you think he'll cry long, missus? Not he, said Nan decisively. And his little breeches is here, and his waistcoat, and... Mummy, mummy, shrieked little Rob. The woman paused, distracted between his appeal and the sound of the whistle screaming at her, Late, late, late. He, but we're late to work, aren't we? said Rob's mother, apologetically, to no one in particular. Mammy, shrieked the little lad. Then, Rob's mother looked at the woman, whom she had been told by someone wanted a child to nurse. You'll not hit him, will you, missus? she asked pleadingly. I've never hit him in his life. Cherry saw Nan look back at the mother who was scarcely older than Polly. Jesus wept, she said with emphasis. What do you take me for? But she had winced. There was a great outcry when the door closed for Mammy. There were two terrible hours in which little Rob would not be comforted. I want my Mammy, was the one reply to all they could say. He was so tired out that he slept at breakfast town whilst Nan and Cherry breakfasted. Where's this from? quoth Cherry as he opened a green envelope. Nan watched him open it. He stared at it like a man in a dream. It's my name, he said at length. But I've bought no ticket in the great Hamburg lottery. They say I've won. That's when they were drunk, said Nan. They stared at each other. Then, how much? asked Nan. Two thousand marks, he said. Is that pounds? asked Nan. I don't know, he said. Billy Breeze had lent him a dictionary. Nan reached it. We're worth one hundred quid, he said dazedly. Then, querulously, Nan! Why did to pawn my phono? We should have been able to set the Hallelujah Chorus on now. At the end of the week, the street was amazed to see great things going on in that front parlour of the cherries. 
to hear men knocking all day, shelves being fixed, great box-like partitions being made in the room, and finally a board being fixed under the window, then brass rods on which hung curtains. All was made clear when a sign appeared over the door, on which was painted the following inscription, W and A Cherry, Fent Dealers. Cherry had made the shrew his partner. He was trying new tactics, breaking down the barriers of antagonism by trying to introduce co-partnership. He didn't believe in it industrially, but he did in the domestic realm. The exchange was synonymous with the change of the name in the rent book. Cherry was once more a citizen with a vote. Nan had half reluctantly sold a vote for partnership in the shop. The street was sceptical about the business. But when Cherry went forth on his wheels with a box in front of him containing his wares, it began to believe a little. There was something in the countenance of the once ruddy giant that told he was out to try. Struggling with his limitations was his will bigger than his body now. If only he'd a decent wife, Nan heard on the other side the bay's curtains one morning. A helpmate, as you might say, I dare say he'd have done very well. But she's so heathenish, as you might say. They'll never make it pay. Nan withdrew. She was a fighter by nature. Previously, she had fought Cherry. It was still only a dubious truce that existed between them. But she was now concentrated on her hatred of the little street. She was determined to make it eat its words. Their shop should be a success. When Cherry came back, tired and a little dejected from a morning of poor results, he was surprised to see in the window a square card on which was written in Nan's giant Potookish writing, Shirts and working aprons made to order. She only yapped at him in response to his query as to why she'd done this. They'll have to give the little lad up now, he said. Now to sort, she said and her light leaped out at him from her eyes. It was the first flash of motherhood he had seen in Nan. He could only reconcile the change in her towards children to the slow change that comes to human beings in the space of fourteen years. Little Rob called her Mammy Cherry, and had all that innocent fondness for her, an animal gift to the hand that feeds it. Cherry sometimes thought that if the lads had lived, she would have been like a lioness with her cubs. But the great inconsistency was, she had let them die without realising it. More and more, the ex-porter was wonder-filled at the anomalies of human nature, his own in particular. He was still only a shadow of the man he had been, but he was getting used to it, and they had not had a row for five weeks. He had the date in his breast pocket book. He wondered sometimes if the sight of those crosses on the almanac had not sometimes enraged Nan into outbursts. Polly regarded the shop as a child does a new toy, and a great advertisement appeared in the narrow field herald. Cherry was doing the thing large. The doorbell began to tinkle quite frequently. Meanwhile, the National Union of Railwaymen put the proposal before its members that Cherry's case be taken up. Meanwhile, through the law's delays, Cherry trundled about his business. He had not much faith in law, now. As for Nan, she snapped and sewed on the sewing machine that made a noise like a crushing engine, sewed and snapped, often wondering as to the meaning of the three knocks that had fallen on the door that night. One day she went down into Tannerfold. She came back early, shaken and white. The three knocks, according to Nan, had been given by the departing soul of the repentant Lizzie, who had died after a drinking fit. Whether she took it as a warning or not, Cherry could not tell, but she kept a civil tongue and a big fire that evening, and made a potato pie for supper, whilst his mind realised that when the storm did break, long delayed as it had been, it would be one of the fiercest they had ever known. Meanwhile, he was having a rest. His pipe was tinted a golden brown now. Little Rob called him Daddy Cherry. Rag had caught his first rat and was reported in glowing colours. Polly had got a quarter of a column's critique in the Herald on her rendering of I know that my Redeemer liveth. 
and the shot was steadily making headway. Cherry's misery was now of an intermittent character. His life was being reconstructed slowly, painfully. There were odd moments when he found himself forgetting his infirmity, but they were only moments. He was conquering himself no more quickly than he was conquering now. Somewhere, when he was quite, quite old, he sometimes thought he would come to a quiet, twilight place where he would regret nothing. For Cherry did a lot of thinking now. There was quite a little woof of thoughts running through his days and his evenings. They all tended one way, to a greater sense of being indivisible with the rest of the world and towards a greater tolerance to none, a firmer resolve, when the storm did burst, not to itter. 